Hello. Now that you have a good understanding of the phenomenon of wave motion, let's now study to understand the nature of light. What is light? I am able to communicate with you through this medium because of light. Light is everywhere in the universe. Have you ever thought of what exactly light is? Well, for one thing, light makes us see things. Can you imagine a life without seeing things, enjoying the beauty around you? Light carries information from the rest of the world to our brain. Et. Light is a very perplexing phenomenon. Do we really understand what light is? In this lesson, we will make an effort to understand what light is. Well, our understanding of the universe from the Big, from the big Bang to the structure of the subatomic particles have been actually made possible by light. Now, I want to take you to a journey from the outside universe into the interior of the subatomic particles. Now, such a big journey, and I'll be with you in a All right, look at the universe. If you are able to go in a spaceship and out into space, probably this is what you will see. What I'm going to do is take each piece, a small piece, and try to make it bigger. Now, look what happens when you look closely into the universe. I'm now going to take you into a galaxy. All right, now, this is part of the galaxy. And now, we are somewhere in the great big nebula. All right, let's continue our journey. Well, there we are. We are now coming closer. We're going to locate our own star. There are billions and billions of stars in that galaxy. We came out from the outside universe where you have super galaxies into our own galaxy, the Milky Way, and our sun, the star that produces all the energy for us, the light that makes us see things, is coming from our sun. Let's explore more about that. Well, there I think we are locating our sun there. Let's have a closer look at our sun. Well, here now we have seen the sun and the solar system. You see the journey we have come so far from the edge of the universe all the way to our solar system. And now, look at the beauty of the solar system with the sun at the center and all the planets that goes around it. What does this blue orbit represent? That is our beautiful Earth. Okay, let's go deeper into and look closer into our Earth. We are now going to go and locate our Earth in here. Look, all these are made possible by light. Isn't light magnificent? All right, let's take a closer look at our Earth. Well, we are nearly able to locate it over there. This is the orbit of the Earth. And I can barely see it now. That is our beautiful Earth. Now, look at that. And we are right here. That's uh, the Florida Panhandle. Is that right? Okay, let's go deeper into somebody's backyard in Pensacola. All right, let's go. There we are. And we're going to go into somebody's backyard there. Can you see that? There. And you can see the houses, the garden, and the 
well, a bush area behind the house. Let's go deeper and look at a tree. All right, let's now concentrate on a leaf. We're going to go deeper into the leaf now. And what do we see there? Now, okay, look at the various parts of the leaf. The beauty of nature revealed to us how through light. Okay, I want you to appreciate the value of light. That's why I'm showing you this. Now, go deeper onto the leaves. What do you see? Look at the intricacies and the beauty of nature. Let's go deeper into the leaves. Now you are looking at the cells of the leaf. All right. Let's go deeper into the cell. What do you see there? You see the structure of the cell? You are now looking at the chromosomes that make up the DNAs and the genes and things like that. Is that right? We are able to do all these because of light. Go deeper. What are these made of? They are made of atoms and molecules. Now, can you really see them? Yes, you can. All right. Let's go deeper into the atoms and molecules. Now, you are now looking at an atom. Look at that. When you look inside an atom, an atom is actually a lot of empty space and it contains electrons and protons. There you have an atom. And look at the beauty of the atom. There you have the nucleus of an atom that contains positively charged protons. And go deeper into it. Well, what do you see there? Well, I don't think we can go any deeper. We came from the edge of the universe almost into the atom. And what is it? The, all this is a great big dance. Well, the whole universe is a great big dance and what makes it possible for us to enjoy that great big dance is the light. So, we are thankful for the beautiful light we have. So, let's go deeper and find out what light is. The question still remains, what is light? And where does it come from? Let's try and explore some of these aspects. Now, light is generally produced by one of three methods. All right, I'm going to give you those three methods, then I will talk about each of those. The first method of producing light is called the method of incandescence. That is, the emission of light from hot objects. Any object that is heated to a very high temperature will emit light. Incandescence. The second way of emitting light is electric discharge and fluorescence. I will talk about that as we go on. A third method is luminescence, the emission of light when excited electrons fall to their normal energy levels. Well, you don't know what that is. I will talk to you that also. So we will discuss these three methods of producing light. Let's talk about incandescence. What is incandescence? We see an example of incandescence when an iron bar is heated to a very high temperature. You see, I'm holding an aluminum rod. If I heat this gradually, a time will come when this will become red. And a time will come when this will become white hot. It will begin to emit light. Anything that is heated to a high enough temperature will emit light. Now, you see a bulb here, a filament bulb. Now, if I turn it on, what will happen? 
you can see what happened here is the electricity passing through the filament has heated it to about 5000 degrees Celsius and this is now producing light now this is incandescence all right now we are familiar with it because we use incandescence to produce light every day in our homes as the temperature rises it glows red first you know even the filament of a bulb as you start heating it first it becomes red and then it becomes white in order to produce white light the temperature has to be very high about four to five thousand degrees celsius so the process we are seeing which turns heat energy into light energy is called incandescence. When you heat an object, that heat energy is turned into light energy. And that is what we call incandescence. Incandescent lamps derive their name from there. You can see this is an incandescent lamp or the one I just showed you. Well, another way of producing light is electric discharge and fluorescence. Now, what is electric discharge? If you want to see what electric discharge is, just go to the car battery and take a wire and connect the positive to the negative. Now, please don't do that. What will happen? A big spark will jump. That is electric discharge. When the positive is connected to a negative, electricity will jump from the positive to the negative, producing a big lightning. Lightning is a good example of electric discharge. Light is often produced when an electric current passes through a gas. Now, when you do that with your car battery, the gas is air. Now here I have an example of electric discharge. All these are electric discharge tubes that are used in advertising. I'm sure you are familiar with these kind of things. We see a burst of this light in the sparks of static electricity. Have you ever seen spark flying off your hand when you try to open the door of your car? Have you ever got a shock? Well, if you wear a polyester shirt and then you remove it, electric sparks will jump from the shirt to your body. Have you ever experienced that? They are all examples of electric discharge that produces light. And all of us know what this is. We all have this at home and in the offices. So electric discharge in an evacuated tube produces ultraviolet radiations. You see the fluorescent lamps we have all over here. This is a fluorescent lamp. Now what happens is the electric discharge, there is a positive part and a negative part there. When electric discharge takes place, inside what is produced are ultraviolet radiations. Now, the inside of the tube is coated with a material called a fluorescent material. And that is, in most cases, it is zinc sulfide. This zinc sulfide has one property. It will absorb the ultraviolet radiations. You see, ultraviolet radiations you cannot see. But the zinc sulfide will absorb this ultraviolet radiations and give out visible light. And that is the light we see from the fluorescent lamps we have. So the tube is coated inside with a fluorescent material, which is mostly zinc sulfide, and that will absorb the ultraviolet radiations and give off visible light. And this process is what we call fluorescence. Fluorescence. And the zinc sulfide is a fluorescent material. So fluorescence is another way to produce light. A third way and the most common way that most of the light in the universe is produced is called luminescence. 
luminescence. What is that? Now, all the light we have in the universe is actually produced by nuclear reactions that keep the stars shining. You see, this is a star. What is happening inside a star? The inside the star, the temperature is so high. Inside the star, our star, the inside temperature is about 15 million degrees Celsius. What happens is, at that very high temperature, the uh, simple atoms of hydrogen collide against each other, fuse to become helium, nuclear fusion, and it produces a lot of energy. So, most of the energy that we get in the universe are produced at the core of stars due to nuclear reactions. Now, the high temperatures on the surface of the stars. Now, as you move out from the core of the sun or the core of the star to the surface, the temperatures will be very high. The temperature of our sun, the surface temperature is 5,500 degrees Celsius. Now, don't confuse. The center temperature, the core temperature is 15 million degrees Celsius. And that kind of temperature is needed to produce the nuclear fusion. But outside temperature, the surface temperature of the sun is about 5,500 degrees Celsius. It is at this temperature that incandescence happens. Now, what is incandescence? Well, let me try to explain this. Now, an atom, most of you know what an atom is. Let me see if I can draw a picture of the atom for you. Now, an atom has a central nucleus which is positive and electrons will be moving around in what we call orbits. So, there are electrons all around the nucleus. Okay, listen to this carefully now. If this is a simple picture of the atom, which is not really a true picture, but at the moment this is good enough. Now what happens is, the electrons in various orbits, now you know from your discussions earlier of energy, that energy of an object is the least when the objects are close together. So, the potential energy of these electrons in the inner orbit will be less than the energy of the electrons in the outer orbit. The, in order for that el electron to stay in the outer orbit, they need extra energy. Now, when you heat an object, like you heat an object like this, what happens? You are supplying extra energy. And when the atoms receive extra energy, you know what happens? Electrons from the inner orbit will jump to the outer orbits because they all have extra energy. Now, I want you to listen carefully here. When an electron from its normal position jumps to an outside orbit, we say the atom is excited atom is excited, it's no longer normal. Now, an atom cannot stay excited for a very long time. That means these electrons that jump to the outer orbit, they have to come back. Now, what happens when they come back? An electron sitting here has more energy than an electron sitting here. So, if an electron from here wants to go back to its normal position, it has to throw away energy. Actually, light that we see is the energy thrown away by electrons like this. Okay, I'm going to now go on. Now, when these excited atoms, well, what excited atoms? Look at the sentence. The high temperatures on the surface of the stars, like our sun, cause the atoms of gases to be excited. Now, what does that mean? The electrons from the inner orbit 
move to the outer orbit because of the extra energy they received because of the high temperature. Now, when these excited atoms return to their normal state, you see, atoms don't remain excited for very long. They have to come back to the normal state. What happens? The extra energy is actually given out. You look at that. This electron is coming from an outside orbit into the inner orbit in its normal position. It gives off the extra energy. And the extra energy given off like this is actually light. And we call these energy given off are energy packets. You see, when an electron gets transferred from an outer orbit to an inner orbit, the difference in the energy is given off. And that difference in the energy is a packet of energy. We call that packet of energy a photon. So the photons emitted like this are identified with their wavelength and frequencies. Well, what does that mean? It means the energy that is given off by these electrons, which we call photons, are actually waves. And you know from our earlier discussions, a wave has a wavelength and frequency. Well, now if the wavelength is very long, the frequency is very small. You know that, is that right? Yes. So, the wavelength and frequency of the radiated photons depend on the temperature of the radiating object. You see, if the temperature is very high, the frequency of radiation will be very high. That means the waves will be very small. On the other hand, if the temperature is not very high, the radiation, the energy will not be very high, the waves will be of low energy. Low energy waves are very long. The frequency will be very small. Now, infrared, heat, are low energy waves. Whereas visible light is much more energetic, short waves. We will talk about that as we go on. Now, objects below around 700 Kelvin produce very little radiation at the visible wavelength. Now, I remember telling you in my previous lesson that objects at all temperatures radiate energy. This object is now radiating energy, but those radiations are not visible. Now, what are the kind of radiations that are coming out from this aluminum rod? There will be radio waves, there could, be in, there could be microwave. They are very long waves. But in order that this may emit heat radiations, you've got to heat it. When you supply heat to this, this will begin to glow red. It is at that time infrared radiations begin to come out. You see, if you heat it to about 700 degrees Celsius, this will turn red. It will begin emitting infrared radiations or heat radiations. In order that this may emit visible light, you may have to heat it to about 3,000 to 4,000 degrees Celsius. So objects below around 700 Kelvin produce very little radiation that are visible. Now, Objects above this temperature, however, start to produce radiation at the visible wavelength, starting at red. You see, first this will start to glow red. Then it will turn orange, yellow, white and so on. So, you can see visible light itself is made up of these different colors. And each color corresponds to an energy value. So which color has the greatest energy value? If I arrange the colors, let's write down some colors. Red, orange, yellow, 
green, blue, violet. Now, I'm going to draw some waves there. I'm going to draw them vertically. If this is a red wave, that is an orange wave, that is a yellow wave, that is a green wave, that is a blue wave, and that is a violet wave. Now, I drew the waves vertically like this. Remember, when you draw a wave, a wave has a crest and a trough. And look at that, as you move from red to orange to yellow to green, blue, violet, the wavelength is becoming shorter and shorter and shorter. Means the waves are becoming more and more energetic. So, as you increase the temperature of the object, all these radiations will begin to be given out. And when all these radiations uh, start giving out, the temperature will be about 5000 degrees Celsius. Okay. Now, the sun emits most of its radiation in the visible wavelength. That means most of the light that is emitted from the surface of the sun. What is the surface temperature of the sun, I told you? It's about 5,500 degrees Celsius. And the light that is coming at that temperature is all in the visible. But also, from the sun comes infrared, that are heat rays, ultraviolet, and so on. There is a wide spectrum of radiations that are coming from the sun. Now, an object emits radiations at all temperatures. I told you that. The wavelength of the radiation depends on the temperature. When you heat an object to a very high temperature, the wavelength of the radiation will be shorter. Now here I have a picture of the most prominent wavelength. Now look at the lower curve. The bump on the curve represents the, the most prominent wavelength. Now here the most prominent wavelength is about 2.5 microwaves. So most of the waves at 1250 Kelvin, that's the temperature there, at this temperature of 1250 Kelvin, most of the waves are microwaves. And as you increase the temperature at about 1500 Kelvin, most of the radiations will be about two microwaves. Now, as you increase the temperature to about 2000 Kelvin, most of the radiations will be about one micrometer. You see, as the temperature increases, the wavelength of the most prominent radiation becomes shorter and shorter. And what is the temperature that is required for visible light? And if you look at visible light, visible light is made up of all these beautiful colors. And the temperature for the visible light to be emitted is above 4000 degrees Celsius. Only above 4000 degrees Celsius you will start seeing visible light. So the figure shows how the peak wavelength emitted by a radiating source change when the temperature increases. As the temperature increases, the wavelength emitted becomes shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. All right. White light is emitted above 4000 degrees Celsius. Now, visible light consists of over 3000 different wavelengths. Now, it is a false idea that visible light contains only seven colors. Many people think visible light contains only seven colors. Well, visible light consists of over 3,000 different wavelengths. And each wavelength is a color. Now, 
combinations of various wavelengths produce the colors that we perceive. When you see a red color, now how many different shades of red colors do we have? We have hundreds of different shades of red colors, right? So the colors that we actually see are combinations of different shades and each color is a distinct wavelength. Red color is at the long wavelength end. You see the wavelength of red colors will be long and violet is at the short wavelength. Now what I have shown here is a complete picture of what we call electromagnetic radiations. You see, electromagnetic radiations is a complete spectrum of radiations that are emitted by objects. Now, you know I have talked about this. The longest of the electromagnetic radiations, they are kilometers long, are radio waves. Then we come to short waves, microwaves. Then we come to infrared. Infrared are heat radiations. And look at the visible light region of all the electromagnetic radiations. Visible light is a very small part. And here I have uh, made it look big. Look at our visible light. Now, you got near infrared, then red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, and then goes on to ultraviolet. And the wavelength of the red are the longest, about 700 nanometer. You know what a nanometer is? And violet is about 400 nanometer. That means there are about 3,000 different wavelengths between red and violet. And all the colors that we see are actually combinations of these 300 different wavelengths. Well, so, have we answered the question, what is light? Now, well, we haven't. What we're going to do is, we're going to answer this question piecemeal. Well, one piece at a time. Now, what we now know is that light is a form of wave electromagnetic waves is that right and waves have wavelength and the frequency so at the moment our understanding of light is that light is a form of wave that is our earlier understanding of light the wavelength and frequency of light determine its color right the long wavelengths are red as the wavelength becomes shorter and shorter, we see colors to orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, and so on. Now, here again, I have a picture of those colors. You see the wavelength from 700 nanometer to 400 nanometer. And this is called the spectrum of visible light. And this actually contains 3,000 different wavelengths. All right. And you know what a wavelength is, right? We talked about that. A wavelength contains a full crest and a full trough. Well, some of the properties of light. Light travels in straight line. Now, when... When I stand in front of the screen, do you see my shadow at the back? Yes. Why, why is light able to produce a shadow like the sharp shadows? It is because light can only travel in a straight line. You see, if light could travel in a bent path, a shadow will never happen. So, shadows are cast by light indicating that light travels in a straight line. Light energy are transported in the form of rays. What is a light ray? Actually, there isn't anything called a light ray. This is all our invention. 
Scientists actually invented the idea of light rays. A ray simply represents the direction of light propagation. The direction in which light moves is indicated by drawing a line with an arrow, and that is a ray of light. Now, on ray diagrams, when you want to draw diagrams using ray, they are actually represented by lines with arrows. And when you have a bundle of rays, a bundle of rays, a bunch of rays, we call it a beam of light. Look at that. One ray, two rays, three rays, four rays, four, you got a beam of light. A beam of light is a bundle of rays. And look at the way a ray is represented. A line with an arrow indicating the direction in which the light is traveling. Well, the reason why light can form shadows and images. What is an image? Well, you are able to take pictures on a camera because light can form your image on a screen. Have you seen images formed on a screen? A pinhole camera illustrates how an image is formed due to the rectilinear propagation. Have you ever played with a pinhole camera? If you make a box, now here I have a box, a paper box, I just took a paper box and make a hole. Can you see the hole at the center here? Yeah, make a small hole and on the other side use a translucent paper. Well, take a piece of paper and put some oil on it. And now, if you keep an object in front, you can actually see the image on that screen like this. Now, this is the pinhole that you constructed. You keep an object there, and I want you to now appreciate the meaning of rectilinear propagation. What is the meaning of rectilinear propagation of light? Light travels in a straight line. A ray of light starting from the top of the, the flower walls go through the hole and falls at the bottom of the screen. A ray of light starting from the bottom of the flower walls after going through the hole falls at the top of the screen. And so you see an image of this object which will be upside down. It's very interesting to play with. Now, you can see here, a little girl is playing with a pinhole camera, and she says, my whole family is upside down. Now, let me see if I can show a pinhole camera. Give me a second. Now, watch this object. What is the object? The object is a lighted bulb. Can you see the shape of the filament? The shape of the filament is an inverted U. Is that right? Yes, it's an inverted U. Now, have a look at the shape of that filament. It's an inverted U. Now, I'm going to keep the pinhole camera directly in front of it. Now, look at the image on the screen. What does the image look like? The image is upside down. It is now a U. Is that right? The image is now a U there. So the image is upside down. If I move the object backward, I'm moving the object backward, what happens? The image becomes smaller. To make the image bigger, I bring the object forward. You see? It's a beautiful way to produce images. Do you know that in the olden days, pictures were taken using pinhole cameras? I'm now moving the camera back and forth. You can see how the image changes. Is that right? Yes. So, a beautiful way to appreciate the nature of light 
is using a pinhole camera. All right, we will now look at the concept of colors of objects. We see objects of all colors around. I'm wearing a blue shirt and actually the tie is reddish with uh, white dots. Well, the camera will not show that color quite truly, but you know, we love colors, don't we? Now, most of us talk about colors. Well, I don't, I don't talk about much, but I know when you want to buy shirts or dresses, you always look for your, your favorite colors. Now, light falling on an object may be absorbed, reflected, or transmitted. You understand that? When light falls on me, you see, you are able to see my image. You are actually not seeing me. You are seeing my image. Now, how? Light from the projector. You see, I'm actually standing in a dark room. And the projector light is falling onto my shirt and is getting reflected into the camera. So, when light falls on the object, part of it will get reflected and some part will be transmitted. Well, I don't think I will transmit light. Some get absorbed. You see, my shirt will absorb a lot of that light and only a small part will be reflected. So when light falls on an object, part of it is absorbed, part of it is reflected, and some part may be transmitted. Now, colors of opaque object. What is an opaque object? An opaque object is an object that does not transmit light. An object that does not transmit light is opaque. An object that transmit light is transparent, right? Glass is transparent, whereas uh, this box is opaque. So colors of opaque object is due to selective absorption of certain characteristic wavelength. So what does that mean? It means when white light from the projector falls on my shirt, this will absorb all wavelengths. How many wavelengths are there in white light? Over 3000. It will absorb all wavelengths except the wavelengths that correspond to this color, blue, which is reflected. And that is why you see it as blue. The camera gets only the blue color from my shirt. You see that? Now, why is my jacket looking dark? Anybody tell me why is my jacket looking dark? What is darkness? Darkness is the absence of light. So, when white light falls on my jacket, it absorbs all the colors, all the wavelengths, and nothing gets reflected. So, no wavelength is reflected from my jacket. It looks dark or black. So, black is the absence of colors. When white light falls on a red object, it absorbs all other colors except red, which is reflected. So when white light from the projector falls on my tie, right, it absorbs all other colors except the, the wavelength that corresponds to red, which is reflected into the camera so that you can see my tie as red. Now tell me now, what will a red object look when viewed in green light? Suppose the projector only gave out blue light. What will my tie look in that color? You see, my tie will absorb all wavelengths except the wavelength that corresponds to red. So, if the projector gives out only blue light, my tie will absorb that blue. That means it will not reflect anything. My tie will look dark. So 
I will, you will see my picture with a dark jacket with a dark tie. If the color that the projector gives out is only blue. Now, for pure colors, red, blue, and green are called primary colors. So, the three red, blue, and green for pure colors, I'm not talking about pigment colors. So those who are familiar with painting and mixing of pigments will find this contrary to what your experience is. I'm talking about pure colors. So for pure colors, red, blue, and green are called the primary colors. Now, <clears throat> here you have red, green, uh, red, green, and blue. Now, if you mix these three primary colors equally, you get white light. Mixing them in equal proportions produces white light. And you can also see in the background here, what will happen if you mix red and green. Red and green gives you yellow. And red and blue gives you magenta. This color is called magenta. And green and blue gives you a color called cyan or peacock blue, bluish green. So by mixing these primary colors, you can produce secondary colors. Any other color can be obtained by combining these colors in a suitable proportion. If you combine these colors in a suitable proportion, you can produce hundreds of different colors. Now, it's very interesting to play with. Let me see if I can show you an animation of mixing colors. Now, here I have the three primary colors, red, green, and blue. Now, I'm going to go to my computer over there and I'm going to mix these and watch what happens when these primary colors are mixed. All right, well, all I need to do is move the red on to the green. What is produced when red and green are mixed? You get yellow. All right, what is produced when red and blue are mixed? You get magenta. What is produced when blue and green are mixed. You get peacock blue or cyan. And what happens when all the three are mixed? See the region where the three are together. All the three in equal proportions will produce white light. So red and blue produce magenta. Red and green produce yellow and green and blue produce cyan or peacock blue. You can actually mix them in all kinds of proportions to produce different kinds of colors. Now, we can also look at this animation. All right, I want you to look at this one. Again, I have uh, three colors there, red, green and blue, the primary colors, uh, I'm going to mix them equally or in different proportions. What's going to happen is the background will assume the color. Now, all these are mixed in equal proportions. So what's the color you see here? The background is white. When red, green and blue are all mixed equally, you see the background white. Now tell me, if I take away the red, what will the black background look? I simply remove red. The background will look green and blue or greenish blue. All right, watch that now. I'm going to take away the red. You have greenish blue. All right. Now put the red back. We got now white. Take away the green. What is this? We have now magenta. All right, bring back the green and take away the blue. You got yellow. 
And now, look, look at the color changes when I begin to bring down the blue. The, the yellow becomes lighter, you find different shades of colors, you see how the shades changes. Now, keep them in different proportions and you can create any color shade. Now, this is a beautiful animation. Try and play with it and learn about various color shades. I can produce any color by suitably mixing the three, by placing these three in their different positions. All right? So, look at this now. The various color shades that you are able to produce. Isn't that beautiful? Okay, I'm going to leave it for you to play around with that. Now, what I have shown you so far is only for pure colors. The primary colors for pigments are yellow, cyan, and magenta. So pigments, it is exactly opposite. These are the primary colors for pigments. What are they? Yellow, cyan and magenta. So these are the primary colors for pigments. Mixing these in equal proportions will produce black. Those who mix your paints for painting, you know that this is true. All right, now we're going to look at another important concept of light that is reflection of light. All right, we so far discussed two properties of light that is the rectilinear propagation of light. Then we talked about the colors, the different colors. Now we will talk about reflection of light. Now we are able to see illuminated objects because they reflect light into our eye. As I was telling you, you are able to see me because when light falls on me, Light gets reflected onto the camera, and that's why you are able to see me. If I did not reflect any light, you will not be able to see me. Now, light is known to behave in a very predictable manner. If a ray of light could be observed approaching and reflecting off a flat mirror, now, if you take a flat piece of mirror, you can see here, I am actually holding a mirror and you can see the light is reflected back onto the camera. How does it look? The light from the projector is reflected back onto the camera. What you actually see is the image of my projector. You see? That's right. Okay. Now, when light is reflected, the, it follows what is called a law of reflection. Now, let's look at what a law of reflection is. Now, I represent a mirror like this. With, uh, these lines indicate the coating of the mirror. And this is the reflecting surface. So, a mirror has a side that contains the coating and the other side, which is the reflecting side. You see? So this is the reflecting side, and this is the coating. Now, a ray of light, if you look at the blue ray, uh, the blue ray is the ray of light that is falling on the mirror, and such a ray is called the incident ray, the incident ray. So here I have an incident ray, and the ray of light leaving or reflected by the mirror is called the reflected ray. The red ray is the reflected ray. Now, the point where the incident ray falls is called the point of incidence. And if you now draw a line at right angles to the mirror, you see this one? This is called the normal line drawn to the mirror. So there are three lines you have there. The, the first line is the line that represents the incident ray. 
the red one is the reflected ray and the broken line is the normal line drawn at the point of incidence and you notice that two angles are marked there I, I'm going to call it theta now do you know the angle the Greek letter theta well that is the letter theta now I'm going to represent theta i theta i stands for the angle the incident ray makes with the normal and we call that the angle of incidence I want you to learn that what is the angle of incidence angle of incidence is the angle made by the incident ray with the normal this angle is the angle of incidence let me mark it with a sign there so this is the angle of incidence that angle. and that means what will you call this angle that's the angle made by the reflected ray with the normal and that angle then is called the angle of reflection angle of reflection so you have an incident ray a reflected ray a normal the angle of incidence is the angle made by the incident ray with the normal the reflected ray is the angle made by the reflected ray with the normal and now I need to go back and get rid of that yes now according to the law of reflection this is the law of reflection the angle of incidence equal to the angle of reflection so when a ray of light gets reflected from a mirror the angle of incidence equal to the angle of reflection it's a very important rule now watch what happens a ray of light starting from here watch it again falls on the mirror gets reflected that is the normal the angle of incidence there you are all right angle of incidence equal to the angle of reflection watch it one more time okay now reflection produces images now I just showed you here that what you see now is the image of my projector now what is responsible for producing that image is the reflection produced by the mirror now how does an image get formed now what happens is you know that light travels in straight line right and we know that now we expect light to travel in straight line and so all these things a lot of things that we see around us is actually created by that particular property of light now look what happens you have an object here a ray of light starting from the object and falling on the mirror gets reflected like this so if you look from there it is the reflected ray that enters your eye now you see your brain tells you that light travels in straight line that means according to your brain this ray that reaches your eye is really not coming in a bent path like this but it must be coming straight from somewhere here you see the image that you see in the mirror is an illusion created by your brain illusion created by what by your brain thinking that light only travels in a straight line but you notice that this ray actually under, underwent a change in direction because of the mirror the mirror changed the direction of the light but when the light the reflected light reaches the your eye 
your brain does not interpret it as this ray coming from this object. Your brain interprets it as coming directly from this point. Why? Because your brain is conditioned to think that light only travels in straight lines. So your brain sees, your brain sees the light coming from here. And that is called an image. You see, is this really there? If I look into the mirror, I can see my image. Well, when I go back and catch it, it's not there. It's an illusion created in my brain. By what? By the rectilinear propagation of light. Now, if you place your eye in the path of the reflected ray, it, the reflected ray appears to come from behind the mirror. And this is actually an illusion caused by the rectilinear propagation of light. The object seems to be sitting behind the mirror and this is called the image of the object. So reflection produces image. According to the law of reflection, angle of incidence equal to angle of reflection. And in forming the image, that law is really obeyed. All right. The position of the image formed in the mirror depend on where you look from? Well, apparently not. The position of the image does not depend on the position of the eye. Now look at this diagram. You have the object here. You can take any ray falling on the mirror. It gets reflected and the image is going to be formed where this reflected ray appears to come from. When you look from here, this reflected ray appears to come from this point and that is the image. If you look from here, a ray falling on the mirror at this point gets reflected and that reflected ray appears to come from here. Similarly, if you look from there, the reflected ray appears to come from the same point. So it doesn't matter at what point you look from, the image, the position of the image is always the same. Alright, I want you to watch this animation. You can take any number of incident rays and they all get reflected according to the laws of reflection. Angle of incidence equal to angle of reflection. And all these reflected rays will appear to come from a single point. And that single point is the image. Now watch that one more time. The image is where these reflected rays appear to come from. That is the image location. So one, just one more time. Any number of incident rays get reflected according to the laws of reflection. Angle of incidence equal to angle of reflection. And all these reflected rays will now appear to be coming from here. And that is the position of the image. Now, what are some of the characteristics of the image you can talk about? The position of the image, the distance of the object from the mirror, equal to the distance of the image. You see, this distance equal to that distance. That's a characteristic of the image formed in a plane mirror. So, the image formed in a plane mirror is always of the same size as that of the object. And it is formed behind the mirror as far behind the mirror as the object is in front of it. All right, let's now talk about curved mirrors. Now, have you ever seen a curved mirror? A mirror that is curved. So far, we were talking about images formed by plane mirror. 
Now, before we go to the curved mirrors, let me show you, if I can, a demonstration on how a mirror like this reflect the light rays and how the image is actually formed. Here I have a ray box that generates a beam of light. If you see, there are five rays here. One, two, three, four, five. And if I keep a plane mirror, I have a plane mirror here, I can reflect these light rays. Now look at the way they are reflected. Now they, each of these rays are is reflected according to the law of reflection. The incident ray, and that is the reflected ray. And if you draw a normal at that point, the angle of incidence will be equal to the angle of reflection. Now, if you look into the mirror, can you see the image of the object? This is the object there, which is giving us that light. Now, look at the image of the object. When I look from the mirror, these reflected rays, these reflected rays will appear to be coming from, so if you keep your eye here, where I am pointing, if you look from here, these reflected rays, look at that, these reflected rays appear to be coming from behind the mirror. And that is where the image is formed. All right? Well, that is how a plane mirror forms image. Now, what is the difference if the mirror is curved instead of being straight or plane? What difference will it make in the image formation? Now, here I have a curved mirror. Now look at the way the image is formed. In order to study the image, you need to look at the different kinds of rays. Now the rays getting reflected from the plane, the curved mirror also obeys the laws of reflection. Now we will look at some terms that we're going to associate with a curved mirror. A curved mirror has a principal focus. Now, what is the principal focus of a curved mirror? Now, if this is the object, a light ray that is parallel to the axis of the mirror. Now, this line is called the axis of the mirror that goes to the center. And its name is the principal axis. So, a curved mirror has a principal axis. If you now take a ray that is parallel to that principal axis, after reflection, it will go through a point on the principal axis, and that is called the principal focus of the mirror. Also, the curved mirror has a center of curvature. Now, what is the center of curvature of a curved mirror? Now, here I have a sphere. You have seen this sphere before. Now, if I cut a small piece, you see here? If I cut a small piece out of this, this will be like a curved mirror. And now, the center of the sphere, the center of this sphere, from which we have cut that curved mirror, is called the center of curvature of the mirror. In other words, this curved mirror is part of a big sphere. If you can now construct the whole of that sphere, the center of that sphere is the center of curvature of that mirror. So you got to learn, I gave you three terms now about a curved mirror. What are they? A curved mirror has a principal axis, it is that line, then it has a center of curvature, it has a principal focus. Now I'm going to define principal focus one more time. A ray starting from the object parallel to the principal axis after reflection 
will go through the principal focus. Also, if you take a line that passes through the principal focus, after reflection it will go parallel to the principal axis. And that is the principal focus. The distance from the center of the mirror to the principal focus is called the focal length. If you measure the distance from the focal length to the center of the mirror, that distance will be the focal length. So a curved mirror has a focal length. The size and position of the image depend on the position of the object relative to the center of curvature. In other words, relative to the center of curvature, where do you place the object? If you place the object beyond the center of curvature, or if you place the object between the center of curvature and the mirror, the images will be different. We will look at a couple of those cases in the next uh, image. Now here I have the picture of how the image of an object is formed. Now look at some of the light rays that I have chosen. Remember my definition of principal focus. What is the definition of principal focus I gave you? A light ray that is parallel to the principal axis. Now here I have a light ray that is parallel to the principal axis. After reflection will go through a point on the principal axis and that point is called the principal focus. If a light ray starting from the object goes through the principal focus after reflection from the mirror it will go parallel to the principal axis. Now, once you know that, you can construct images using that principle. An object placed farther than C. Now, this is the center of curvature. The object is placed at a distance away from the center of curvature. Now, where is the image going to be formed? The image is going to be formed here. That means when you look from anywhere here, all these light rays that is coming after reflection will appear to be coming from here. You see, the point where the reflected rays will meet, all the reflected rays are meeting at that point. And the point where the reflected rays meet is where the image is formed. Now, there is a big difference between this image and the image we saw in the case of a plane mirror. Now, what is the big difference? In the case of the plane mirror, there was nothing behind the mirror. It was an illusion. Light rays did not really meet where the image was formed. The image was an illusion given by the fact that light rays travel in straight line. On the other hand, this image, due to this curved mirror, is actually formed by the actual intersection of the reflected rays. And therefore, we say this image is a real image. It is a real image because it really happens. The image in a plane mirror is an illusion. It is a virtual image, we say. What is virtual? Virtual is something that is not real. Whereas this is a real image. Now, where is the image formed? The image is formed between the center of curvature and the principal focus. So, if you keep an object like this beyond the center of curvature, the image of that object will be formed between the center of curvature and the principal focus. And look at the image. The image is upside down. Just like in the case of the pinhole camera, you saw the image was upside down. So the image in this case is upside down. Okay, let's now look at an 
object placed between the center of curvature and the principal focus. How is the image formed? Now look at the way I'm going to locate the image. I take a ray that goes parallel to the principal axis. This is a ray that is parallel to the principal axis. After reflection from the mirror, that ray will have to pass through the principal focus. So that's one ray. And then, if you now take a ray that passes through the principal focus, after reflection from the mirror, it will go parallel to the principal axis. And look at the point where they meet. The image is formed at a point where the reflected rays meet. So here we have the location of the image. An object placed between C and F, the center of curvature and the principal focus, is formed beyond C and it is upside down. Is that right? And it looks smaller than the object or bigger than the object. Well, the image is bigger than the object. So you can see, if this is the object, that is the image. The image is magnified. It looks bigger than the object. Now, you can see the mirror that you see very often in hotels where you can see your face magnified is actually a curved mirror. The mirror in your car, the rear view mirror, in your car is actually a curved mirror. All right. There you have an object placed between the center of curvature and the principal focus, and the animation shows how the image is formed. The image is formed beyond the C. It is a magnified, inverted, and real. It is real because it is formed by the actual intersection of the reflective rays. Okay, when the object is placed closer than the principal focus, all right, let's uh, construct that image. If the object is placed closer than the principal focus, then you have a different image altogether. Look at uh, the rays that I have chosen. If you take a ray that is going to pass through the center of curvature, that will be a ray that will fall at right angles to the mirror. It will go straight back. Now, these two reflected rays, the pink and the green, are the reflected rays. If you keep your eye somewhere here, you can see, now, watch that again, a ray parallel to the principal axis after reflection goes through the principal focus. There you are. Now, that image that you saw was not a real image. Why is this not a real image? This is not a real image because when you look from here, these reflected rays really do not meet. But when you look from here, these reflected rays will appear to be coming from behind the mirror. So this is an image similar to the one that was formed in the plane mirror. This is the virtual image. The image really doesn't exist. And uh, the image that you see in the mirror that is in the hotel, that will help you to shave better, to make your face look bigger. It is this. When you look into the mirror with very, well, you kind of keep the mirror close to your face so that your face is the object. And the object needs to be placed within the principal focus. Then you will see a bigger image behind the mirror. It is a virtual image because reflected rays do not meet at that point. They only appear to come from that point.